Good evening. evening. Welcome to the Mob Museum. Uh, My name is Jeff Schumacher. I'm the Vice President of Exhibits and Programs. Such a great audience. Appreciate everybody coming downtown for us. Um, Our speaker tonight has been here several times before, and each time he brings us something new, some new information about the history of the mob in Las Vegas, and tonight is no exception. Larry Gregg is a historian and the author of 10 books. Earlier in his career, and I'm saying this a little bit tongue-in-cheek, earlier in his career, Larry dabbled in the study of colonial America. He has written numerous scholarly books and articles about topics such as the Salem witchcraft trials and the Quaker settlement in 17th century Barbados. Of course, Larry was just warming up for his real passion, the history of Las Vegas. Uh, He's written several wonderful books on Las Vegas, including Bright Light City, which looks at how Las Vegas has been perceived in popular culture, great book, and Becoming America's Playground, which chronicles how Las Vegas promoted itself to the world in the 1950s. Naturally, while researching Las Vegas, Larry could not help but take an interest in how organized crime figures have shaped our city. His biography of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, no doubt heard of him, is the most authoritative book-length portrait of the notorious mobster. And Larry's latest book, which he will speak about tonight, is a biography of Mo Sedway, who was is, who is much more than Siegel's right-hand man in Las Vegas. Little Moe, as he was known, was an important figure in the development of the Las Vegas casino industry. As Larry will elaborate upon this evening, Sedway was among the handful of men grilled by the Kefauver Committee in this very courtroom on November 15th, 1950. Now, uh, Larry is working on the third installment uh, of his Las Vegas biographical trilogy, an in-depth look at Wilbur Clark of the Desert, of Desert Inn fame, and who, incidentally, also was questioned in this courtroom by the Kefauver Committee on that fateful day in 1950. Um, so, you know, as usual, we'll take some questions uh, after Larry's talk, uh, and then there will be a book signing Uh, If you have an interest in the history of this town, uh, this book is a must-have, in my opinion. So please join me in welcoming Larry Gregg. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I can't see you. It's so bright up here. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's a treat to be here. I, I love this museum. Every time I, I'm in Las Vegas, I try to come down and look at the exhibits. And I did that yesterday. I came through yesterday afternoon and sat in this room and watched the roughly 15-minute program on the Kefauver Committee. And what I noticed is something I, I don't usually see in museums. Usually people will sit down for the beginning of a, of a little film clip and they'll get bored and they'll walk off. But there were several people seated here, and they stayed through the whole thing, which says a lot about the quality of that that 15-minute program. Well, I'm going to talk this evening, as as Jeff indicated, about uh, Mo Sedway. And and the question that I have to answer first, why? Why would anyone write a book about Mo Sedway? And, And... that, that's a fair question because here's a fellow who was only five feet, two inches tall. And when the FBI uh, did a profile of him, they said, here's a man with no physical power. There's, there's no reason to fear Mo Sedway. And then in another characterization of him, in a very dismissive way, they said, during periods of stress, Sedway wrings his hands, becomes wild-eyed, and resembles a small dog about to be subjected to the distasteful procedure of being bathed. <laughs> now, you can't get more dismissive than that characterization. And most authors who write about him will talk about him being essentially a, a gopher for Bugsy Siegel, and, and that includes this author. I, I, I did the same thing when I, I wrote about Mo Sedway. However, about three years ago, I was working on another project, and I started looking at, at the Kefauver Special Committee on Organized Crime and Interstate Commerce and the, the hearing here in Las Vegas, and realized as I looked through the transcripts, the person the Inquisitor spent the most time on was Mo Sedway. 
So I wanted to know why they spent so much time on Mo Sedway and not these other fellows. And then I, I stumbled across an article published in Los Angeles Magazine by a really good journalist named uh, Amy Wallace. She said that she had come across a, a book proposal written by Mo Sedway's widow, Beatrice, B. Sedway. She wanted to have this book be titled Bugsy's Little Lunatic. <laughs> and in this, this manuscript, Wallace said, you, you can learn a lot about their personal lives. So I thought, well, I need to take a look at, at this, this man and see if there was really a book link study here. So how does one go about researching Mo Sedway? Well, if you're going to do any research on Las Vegas in the 1940s and 1950s, you really have to start with the really good historians who have already published on the topic in the 40s and 50s. Uh, the first person that you see in the uh, upper left is the late Hal Rothman, a, a very talented historian of Las Vegas. And then that second guy is it's the guy who just introduced me. Who, and Jeff is a wonderful journalist and historian. Then there are two really talented uh, UNLV historians, Mike Green and, and Dave Schwartz, who have appeared here often, and then the late Gene Mooring. So I got grounded in what they had to say about Las Vegas in the 40s and early 50s. And then I had to get to the primary sources. And if any of you ever want to do research on Southern Nevada, the place to go for primary sources is the Special Collections Library at UNLV, which is an absolute treasure trove of useful material. And what I used for Sedway were, were essentially three collections. They have all the city commission minutes through 1960, and I found Sedway uh, in many of those uh, sessions. And then there's this remarkable treasure trove of oral histories. Uh, I used over two dozen of those oral histories to help get a sense of what Sedway was like in Las Vegas. And then there's this wonderful niche collection, the Southern Nevada Jewish Heritage Project, which is absolutely wonderful, not just for Sedway, but for the growing Jewish community in the 1940s and 50s. And I have spent over 200 days since 2003 in special collections. And sometimes I, I will spend all week long, and by Friday afternoon, I'm pretty worn out. This is a photo of me. <laughs> taken by their gifted <laughs> photographer, Aaron Mays. You really get worn out doing research at Special Collections, but you can see I've put, back, I've put on the pounds again after that. Well, once you're done at Special Collections, you can find a lot from not just the, the hearings that took place in Las Vegas, but the transcripts of all the hearings, and they're searchable. So I was able to just type in Mo Sedway, and he, he comes up in many of, of these investigations in New York and in L.A. and, and other places. And I'm pretty much standing right where uh, Estes Kefauver was standing in, in that photo. Beyond that, uh, any of you can go online and go to the FBI vault, and you just type in the search box, a gangster's name, in my case, I typed in Bugsy Siegel, and there are over 2,000 pages on Bugsy Siegel and the FBI vault. And many of those documents uh, mention Mo Sedway, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to a couple of those a little bit later. And then you have to read newspaper articles. Uh, four Las Vegas papers were especially helpful, the most important one because it was continuous for me from 1941 through 1952 was the Review Journal. A few articles in The Age, which was dying in the mid-40s. The Las Vegas Sun had just started in 1950, but had some very useful articles. And then a wonderful newspaper in the mid-40s called The Morning Tribune. It's the, the newspaper where I found the only interview with Mo Sedway. It was an interesting one because it was 1944, during the presidential campaign of 44, and Mo Sedway was a big Franklin Roosevelt supporter. He said, I met Franklin Roosevelt. I met Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I met Al Smith in New York. He was a big Democrat, and he, every time somebody would come in to bet on a horse race, he tried to get them to think about voting for Franklin Roosevelt. I also subscribed to a couple of newspaper databases, which were really helpful, newspapers.com and Genealogy Bank, and found hundreds of, of newspaper articles. So that's how you, you research a figure like this. Let me quickly move through Mo Sedway's early life and get him to Las Vegas, but you need to know a bit about his background. Uh, he was born in Galicia, which is 
in Poland, the part of Poland annexed by Austria. So in some documents he would say he was from Poland, in some documents he would say he was from Austria. A couple of times he said he was born in, in 1901, but most of the documents indicate he was born in 1894. His family immigrates in 1901, and as most uh, Jewish immigrants did in New York City, he, they located on the Lower East Side, and they located on Rivington Street. And you can see from that sign on the light post, I actually found a photo of where they were living uh, uh, when they migrated to the States. <sighs> He went to school for 10 years, quit after his sophomore year because the family needed him to help in their butcher shop. He managed the butcher shop. In fact, thank goodness for Ancestry.com, when he registered for the draft in 1917, he said he was the manager for his father and therefore he should not be drafted because he was needed at the butcher shop, but they drafted him anyway. And he serves in World War I. I couldn't determine whether he served stateside or, or overseas. After the war, he goes into business, buying a truck and delivering garments in the, in the very busy garment district in New York. But he also began getting involved on the wrong side of the law, like many youngsters in Italian families, Irish families, Jewish families in New York. There were street gangs. Very few of these youngsters went on to become career criminals. Most said we did. I found three instances where he was arrested in the 20s. Uh, for one of those, he, he spent a year in prison. But his most notable crime, or alleged crime, occurred in, in uh, 1936. He and Davy Berman, uh, Berman is very important for Las Vegas in the 1940s. He's from Minneapolis. A lot written about him by his daughter, Susan Berman. Uh, they were arrested, actually it was 1935, not 1936. In 35, uh, they allegedly stole $800,000 worth of treasury notes. Uh, it went to the jury and they, they only spent a few minutes deliberating and found him not guilty. Nonetheless, I, I was looking at some of the material in the New York City Municipal Archives and the Kings County District Attorney concluded in 1939, this guy, Mo Sedway, was one of the most important bootleggers in New York in the 1920s, largely because he was associated with these two guys. He was friends with both Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. He actually said he and Siegel were, were boyhood friends, which actually was impossible because Mo Sedway was born in 1894 and Bugsy Siegel was born in 1906. I can't imagine a 17-year-old palling around with a 5-year-old. <laughs> but they did become friends in the late teens and early 20s. Uh, Lansky and Siegel saw Sedway as important because he had a truck. So as they began bootlegging, they, they, they used Moe with them. Uh, he invested well. The money he made, and he made a lot of money in bootlegging. I just put in three instances here. He invested in a very successful restaurant in New York City. He also invested in some nightclubs, and one that's going to be really important in just a moment. Also a nightclub in Florida, and this is not the nightclub he invested in in Saratoga Springs. Piping Rock is the most popular one, and it's really Meyer Lansky's casino in, in Saratoga Springs. So he makes a lot of money, and he knows how to spend it. He lives well. There, there are big advantages in being a successful gangster. He lived in hotels like the Hotel Piccadilly, which is a luxurious hotel. He traveled in Europe. Uh, he often went to Cuba. He liked going to Cuba. Some suggest he went there as a, uh, a man for Meyer Lansky, trying to determine whether or not it would be a good place to invest money. But as he was doing well, he met... Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to put this in. He... When he died in 1952, and they did an estimate of his estate, he was worth $382,000, and I translated that into $2,023, and he was worth almost $4.5 million upon his death, which is about 10 times the amount Bugsy Siegel was worth. In 35, he meets a 17-year-old girl named Beatrice Kittle. Beatrice was born in Elmira, New York, and her parents... Uh, spoiled her. She wanted to be a professional dancer. Her dad did everything he could to help her get dance lessons, bought her the best dancing shoes. She did the circuit in New England, very, very popular dancer at uh, state fairs. 
And she decided that she was good enough at age 17 to go to the Big Apple and make it in, in the nightclubs there. And she did. She auditioned for uh, a spot in the Paradise Cabaret and learned that one of the investors at the Paradise Cabaret was a 41-year-old man named Mo Sedway. And Mo Sedway, when he saw her, said he fell in love immediately. So you have this 41-year-old man dating the 17-year-old girl. And once they started dating, uh, he was showering her with diamonds and furs. He introduced her, as he put it, to one of my best friends in all the world, Ben Siegel. And she later said when she first saw Siegel, it was his eyes. She said, I was mesmerized by his eyes. And Siegel becomes a good friend of, of Beatrice. And Moe marries her in late November 1935. And one of the extraordinary stories she tells is that Meyer Lansky sent them on their honeymoon to the West Coast to explore whether or not the New York mob should invest in the West Coast. And oh, by the way, while you're there, go to this little town in Nevada called Las Vegas to see if it's worth investing in. And I thought, please, that, that didn't happen. But again, if, if you look at Ancestry.com, my good friend, on the USS Pennsylvania departing December 14th, 1935, there were three passengers of note, Mo Sedway, Beatrice Sedway, and Bugsy Siegel. He went with them on their honeymoon. <laughs> and she said, on the honeymoon, he would buy these perfumes for me and send flowers to our suite. And I know he was just a really, really good friend. So they arrived in San Diego two days after Christmas of uh, 1935. And remember, she said, they were supposed to explore California and then go to this little town, Las Vegas, to see if it was worth uh, investing in. And she gets back to Elmira, New York, and there's an article in the paper that talks about their six-week honeymoon, and they went to California and Nevada and Chicago before coming back to Elmira. Well, maybe that's exactly what happened. The earliest photo I have of them, this is from a collection at, at Special Collections at UNLV. Here's Beatrice and Mo. And the, there's no specific date on this photo, but the collection ends 1940. So I'm assuming this is a photo of them in early 1936 in Las Vegas. Mo is 5'2". Look how short she is. She is under 5 feet tall. She is really tiny. Well, Siegel moves to, to the West Coast in, in the mid-1930s, and so does Sedway. Beatrice comes along with him, and they become very much interested in the race wire business. Uh, one contemporary said, if you're going to make money after Prohibition, you're going to make money with the race wire. And the reason for that is you can only gamble legally at a racetrack, but millions of Americans bet on horse races. So if you can find a bookie in a tobacco shop or somewhere else in your town, you can bet illegally on a race. So the key is, can the bookies get a reliable wire service? And there are 20-plus wire services in the 1920s, and there's one man that comes along who really creates a monopoly on this. And this is Moses Mo Annenberg. By the mid-1930s, he has control of most of the race wire service in America, so if you want to have access to the race wire, you've got to go to this fellow. Well, he is uh, convicted of tax evasion in 1939, and he sells the nationwide wire service to a fellow named Mickey McBride, who changes the name to the Continental News Service before he sells it to James Reagan of Chicago. Well, as that is developing, Ben Siegel, working with Jack Dragna and Johnny Rosselli in Southern California, essentially gains control of the race wire in Southern California. And then he taps Gus Greenbaum in Phoenix to get control of the race wire in Phoenix. And years ago, I got the chance to interview uh, Siegel's eldest daughter, Millicent Rosen. And I asked her, I said, did you ever go to Phoenix with your father, and she was born in 1932, and she said, yes, I do remember once father took me with him to Phoenix, and I met this man, this big man, Gus Greenbaum. So Siegel has extended his influence beyond Southern California to Phoenix, and then 
been to Las Vegas, and we can date it fairly accurately because he was arrested in 1940 on a charge of murder, and the detectives went through his mansion in Holmby Hills, California, and they're going through the filing cabinet, and they find stacks of canceled checks, and one is to Dave Stearns at the Northern Club in Las Vegas for $18,000. So we know that by 1940, he's interested in Las Vegas, but what really gets his attention is a law passed by the Nevada State Legislature that makes Nevada the only state where you can bet off track legally. Now, the best study of, of this law and almost all gaming law up to 1945 is in a dissertation by this really talented historian, Eric Moody. I wish his dissertation had been published into a book because it is marvelous. It's one of the, the places I look for uh, gaming law in the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, all the way to World War II. And he makes a statement in his dissertation, which I agree with 100%. This is the event that gets organized crime figures interested in Nevada and specifically in Las Vegas, because this is the year, 41, that brings Ben Siegel and Mo Sedway to this town. Now, once they get here, they, they want to get control of the race wire coming into uh, Las Vegas. So there's this wonderful letter here in the museum. It's a letter from a man named Tony Corica, who is in Phoenix, and he is one of the distributors for the Continental News Service. And if you can see the, who it's written to, it's M.M. M. Sedway, Las Vegas, Nevada. They're at the top. And what Corica does is award, with this letter, Mo Sedway monopoly control of the race wire for five years. So if anybody in Las Vegas wants access for their casino to the race wire, they've got to go through Mo Sedway, who is backed by Bugsy Siegel. Most people are not afraid of Mo Sedway. Most people are afraid of Bugsy Siegel. So again, if you want access to the wire service, this is the guy you've got to go to. Now, the, the real profit in this for Sedway and Siegel is not so much the fee they charge for the service, but they also tell those who buy it, we get a percentage of your race book. Sometimes it's 20%, 30%, 40%, even more than that. So it's very, very profitable for Sedway and for Siegel. Uh, the value of, of, the, of the race wire is very, very clear to all those who studied organized crime in the late 30s and early 40s. And it's true even today. If you look at the crowds in casinos any night and on the weekends, they're almost always packed. But during the day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday... Casinos are much less popular. But what will get them to come into the casino is the opportunity to bet on horse races. By uh, 44, there are four gambling clubs in Las Vegas that have access to the race wire, the Boulder Club, uh, Dave Stearns Turf Club, uh, the Las Vegas Club of John Kell Housels, and the Frontier Club of, of Guy McAfee. And they've all purchased that service through Mo Sedway. So he and Siegel are making lots of money. Uh, by 46, he's also uh, managing uh, the Rex Club, which is the club under the Apache Hotel, which he transforms into the El Dorado. And one of the things I like to do, in addition to coming to this museum when I'm downtown, is to go look at the old Apache Hotel lobby. It's, it's hard to find, but once you find it, you can go in and look at this wonderful uh, dark wooded lobby. Well, he's doing well, Sedway is, in Las Vegas. And at some point, he and his colleagues want to purchase a hotel. Siegel had wanted to do it as early as 1943. He tried to buy the El Rancho Vegas unsuccessfully. Uh, so he and Sedway and Lansky and probably Dave Berman and some others purchased the very successful El Cortez just a few blocks from here. Sedway and Gus Greenbaum manage this, this hotel and its casino very successfully for one year. They sell it for a big profit, and that profit's going to be very, very useful for the building of the Flamingo. Let me identify these four people up here for you. I think everybody in the room knows who the second guy from the left is. That's Ben Siegel, Mo Sedway to his uh, right, and there's Billy Wilkerson clearly the man who had the inspiration for the Flamingo Hotel. And the fellow on the, on the left end is Gus Greenbaum. What's common to the three guys on the left, they all have cigars. I guess most people didn't smoke cigarettes in, in the 40s and 50s. They, they smoked cigars. 
What we know about uh, Wilkerson and his inspiration and how Siegel took it over is a whole other story. Just suffice it to say that Wilkerson had the idea that there could be a successful resort hotel casino in Las Vegas. He hired an architect, an interior designer, a landscaper, and they said, we can do it for $1.2 million, which doesn't sound like much in 2023, but that was four times what it cost to build the El Rancho Vegas just five years earlier. Uh, Wilkerson could not come up with the money. He ends up turning to a consortium again of figures including Meyer Lansky and Ben Siegel and others. And the flamingo gets going, but Wilkerson is not sure he can do it. He is a compulsive gambler. And at one point he says, I'm done. He writes a wonderful letter to Mo Sedway, which Willie Wilkerson has in the first book he wrote about his father. And I have just one sentence from this intriguing letter. Look at that. Las Vegas is too dangerous for me. I like to gamble too much. In fact, there are some, some checks here in, in the, the museum that Billy Wilkerson wrote to pay off his debts to casinos in Las Vegas. Sometimes he'd lose $10,000 in one night, $12,000. Uh, Willie said one year, I believe it was 1944, his father lost over a million dollars. But he just loved to gamble. He couldn't stop doing it. Well, he does sell this thing to Mo Sedway, but buys it back two months later in November. And the thing gets built, and I always have to put these two photos in, the building of the Flamingo, because I'm always reminded of the singer Rosemarie's comment about the Flamingo. She was there the first night with Jimmy Durante. She said this was an extraordinary resort. But when you looked out any window, all you saw was desert. And she's right. No matter what direction you look at, this beautiful resort hotel is going to be in, in the middle of a desert. Well, it opens. The casino portion opens on December 26, 1946. And I love looking at this photo. This is so much different than anything Las Vegas had ever produced to this point. The other hotels were good hotels, but this is true luxury. And that sign is... Rarely seen in photographs of the Flamingo, where you have the, the parallel of, of the name Hotel Flamingo. That sign has changed after Ben Siegel is murdered. So you don't see this one other than just a, a few months in, in 1947. The hotel portion is completed by uh, March 1 of 47. It's equally beautiful. Nothing like this in Las Vegas at the time. Well, while all this is being constructed, something extraordinary happens. Siegel and Sedway part their ways. And we don't know exactly what caused it. A couple of suggestions. In uh, summer of 46, uh, Ben Siegel wanted to move away from the Continental News Service to a new service called Transamerican, which was started by the Chicago mob. And he told Moe to get it done in August of 46. It doesn't happen until December. And Ben is having to listen to phone conversations from Jack Dragon in Southern California saying, when are you going to get this done? That could have been the reason. Uh, it might have been something else. Several contemporaries said, Mo Sedway told Ben Siegel he was going to run for office. City commission. And Siegel said, we don't run for office, we buy politicians. <laughs> But Mo ran anyway. He ran and he got lots of votes. He did not win a seat, but he did run. Well, whatever the case, there is absolutely clear evidence that they had parted ways. I just put up three quotes here for you. One is from uh, Ben Siegel's girlfriend, Virginia Hill. She said, I don't remember seeing Mo Sedway at the Flamingo, late 46 through 47. The police chief in Beverly Hills, Clinton Anderson, said the same thing. What I learned in investigating this is that uh, Sedway was not even allowed into the building in 40, late 46, early 47. And then I came across an FBI report in summer of 47 after Siegel was murdered. And they it said the people we talked to in Las Vegas, including the police department, say it was just common knowledge that Siegel had been out to break Sedway. I know when it started. I don't know why, but I know when it started because... In the Bugsy Siegel files, there is a transcript of a conversation between Meyer Lansky and Ben Siegel. Lansky flies out to Las Vegas in the summer of 46. He gets a room at the El Rancho Vegas. He calls up Ben and says, you and Moe come over. Let's talk about your progress on the hotel. 
And look at Siegel's response. We don't need Moe. In fact, Moe really doesn't need to be a part of this anymore. I love the last sentence. In short, they could get along better without Moe. Something had caused this bitter dispute. In the unpublished proposal for a book, Beatrice said this is what happened. In March of 47, Ben Siegel called a meeting of his associates at the Flamingo, excluding Mo. And he told them, I want Mo gone. I want him shot. And then I will chop him into pieces and put him into the garbage disposal in the Flamingo kitchen. When Moe found out, he was absolutely terrified. He called Beatrice and said, you've got to come to Las Vegas. I'm scared to death. And she drives over, and they, they, they talk about what they should do. And according to her prospectus for a book, they contacted Meyer Lansky and got Lansky's approval to kill Ben Siegel. But Lansky told them, according to B, it can't be somebody from the family. Nobody from the, the New York family can do it. So a man she had been having an affair with, Matthew Moose Panza, she was under five feet tall. Moose was 6'3", 250 pounds, a giant of a man. And he volunteered to be the shooter. So that's Beatrice's story. Now, to her credit, Amy Wallace says, I have no confirmation for this story. None. All I have is her version of what, what happened. Well, I looked as close as I could into this story of, of the murder of Siegel, and what we can do is look at the chronology of what happened. Ben Siegel, early in the morning of June 20th, flies from Las Vegas to Southern California. Apparently, the last person he talked to in Las Vegas was Hank Greenspun. At least that's what Greenspun said. He was the local publicist for Siegel. And according to Greenspun, I asked him, do you have any problems? Is that why you're flying? And according to Greenspun, Siegel told him, nothing I can't handle. So he flies out to uh, Beverly Hills. He and Virginia Hill had leased this house, and the lease was almost up. I think they had five days left. So he was going there to get some personal items, clothing and, and some personal possessions. And he also was going to Beverly Hills to be at the train station when his two daughters were going to arrive. He and his wife had divorced in August of 46 in Reno, and she got custody of the two daughters. They lived in New York City, but she agreed, Esta, his former wife, agreed that the two daughters could come out and be with their father for a few weeks in the summer of 47. Uh, he met for a little bit with George Raft, to the actor. He was long, long friends with Raft and said, I can't wait to see my girls. They're coming out uh, to see me to go on vacation. He went to his favorite barber to get a haircut. Uh, he talked to his Los Angeles publicist, Paul Price. They were planning a promotion campaign for the, the, the Flamingo in the fall. So he had a good day. And at the end of the day, he and a friend, Alan Smiley, Virginia Hill's secretary, uh, Jerry Mason, and Virginia Hill's brother, Chick Hill, went out for dinner at a new restaurant. And while they're at dinner back in Las Vegas, the second show is ongoing, and we have a a local resident named, uh, oh gosh, Crockett, who is important in aviation in Las Vegas. George Crockett, thank you. Old man's disease, thank you. Crockett said, we were at this second show having a really nice time and, and you know, lots of applause for the performers, but there were eight guys sitting at the table next to us who were not having a good time. They weren't even smiling during the show. But we saw near the end of the show, somebody came over and said something to each one of the guys. And they slowly got up from their chairs, and two of them went to the front door, two of them went to the hotel registration desk, two went to the casino cage, and two went to the security desk. But he didn't have any idea what was going on. And that's near the end of the second show. Well, about that time, uh, Alan Smiley and Ben Siegel and Jerry Mason and Chick Hill are arriving back at 810 North Linden. It's about 1015, 1020. And according to Smiley, he and Siegel were uh, chinning and skimming, chinning, talking, and skimming the newspapers, the early morning newspapers. And at roughly 1055, uh, shots ring out. 
through that window, which is 14 feet away from Ben Siegel. Two of the shots hit him in the head, two hit him in the chest, the other five hit the wall behind him. Well, at 11, right at 11 o'clock, Alan Smiley, who had prior to 11 o'clock yelled up at Chick Hill, call the police and call the doctor, Ben's been hit. He calls an FBI informant at the Flamingo Hotel right after the shooting. So it would be important to know who that informant was. The informant was Mo Sedway. Now, how do I know it was Mo Sedway? Well, uh, there's a wonderful autobiography by the Las Vegas FBI man, Curtis Lynham. He'd, he arrived two months earlier in Las Vegas, and he said the other agents had told him, we have this super informant. That's what they called this guy, a super informant. In his autobiography, Lynham does not identify the super informant, but he describes the super informant. And you can see what the informant told him. Uh, Smiley has said Siegel had been shot in the face and the chest. That's exactly right. And he knew he was dead because half of his fa face was blown away. If you see any of the crime scene photos, that, that's accurate. Well, let's look at this super informant. Look at that bottom quote. This guy knows everybody in the underworld, not just Las Vegas, but throughout the United States. He knows the underworld. Three more clues. He has a wife and children living in Los Angeles. He keeps a mistress in Las Vegas. And he's thought to be a legitimate businessman in town. Let me go through those four clues. Mo Sedway knows everybody in the underworld. We're going to see that when I get to the uh, Kefauver investigation. His wife, Beatrice, and their two sons don't live in Las Vegas. He's got a house on Bonanza, but they live in a mansion in Beverly Hills. Mo has more than one mistress in Las Vegas. In fact, in Susan Berman's book on her father, she said, I remember distinctly Daddy calling Mo Sedway and saying, Moe, she's too young. What are you doing, man? But everybody knew he had mistresses in Las Vegas, and he was thought to be a legitimate businessman in town. So I'm, at this point, 99% sure that this super informant is Mo Sedway, and luckily for Larry, there are two subsequent FBI documents, one from 48, one from 51, that identify Mo Sedway as a confidential informant. Indeed, he is their best confidential informant. So what does that say about Mo Sedway's role in the, in the murder of Ben Siegel? It tells me that he knew what was going to happen, but I can't identify the shooter. I don't believe the story of, of Moose Panza, but I don't have a substitute for Moose Panza. But clearly he knew something because... Remember the chronology. The shooting occurs at about... 10.55, at 11.15, Mo, Gus Greenbaum, and Morris Rose, and an early investor in the Flamingo, walk into the place and say, we are now in control, Ben Siegel's dead. And Siegel's lawyer in Las Vegas, Louis Wiener Jr., later said, I was listening to a ball game that night, and a friend of mine called to say, on the radio, they just said, Ben Siegel's been murdered. So I jumped in my car, I raced out to the Flamingo, and the first person I saw was Mo Sedway. So all the circumstantial evidence is quite clear that Sedway knew that this was going to happen, but again, I'm not willing to make the step that I know who the shooter was, just that Mo Sedway knew what was going to happen. Well, we should know something about Mo Sedway, more importantly, for his role in the Kefauver Committee investigation. Here you see that wonderful photo again, as I'm standing roughly where Estes Kefauver was standing. The man he's talking to on the photo on the left is Lieutenant Governor Cliff Jones. Uh, the Kefauver committee uh, was here on November 15th. Uh, they didn't stay the entire day. They had called many witnesses. They ended up talking to eight. Uh, the most important ones on this list are Bill Moore from the Hotel Last Frontier, uh, Cliff Jones, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Louis Wiener Jr., Siegel's attorney, Wilbur Clark, who just opened uh, the Desert Inn. But again, I'll go back to my point that they spend more time with Mo Sedway. On the wonderful little video that's in here uh, that runs for 15 minutes, if you come visit the, the museum, there's a short clip 
of most headway. And he essentially says this in, in the clip. For me, that's too much information. I really don't want to know <laughs> that much about your illness. Just tell me you've got a fever, you've been sick. I, just, I don't want to know the rest of that. But that's what he said to the, to the, to the committee. But on a serious note, he will have multiple heart attacks after this, and that's, that's what kills him. In January of 1952, he dies from a heart attack while he's on a flight from um, Las Vegas to, to Miami. What he tells the committee in great detail, in roughly two hours of answering questions, is that he had this long, long association with Bugsy Siegel, and that he knew who the gangsters were who were involved in the race wire, in the El Cortez, and the Flamingo. And they were just flabbergasted that this one little guy knew so much about all these. So then they decided, well, let's just list the name of all the great gangsters of the era and see if he knows them. Do you know Frank Costello? Yes. In fact, six weeks ago, I had a drink with him at the uh, Plaza Hotel in New York City. Do you know Meyer Lansky? Absolutely. Lucky Luciano, yes. Mo Daglitz, yes. Jack Dragna, yes. Joe Adonis, yes. He knows them all. He knows who the kingpins are in the underworld. He worked with one, Bugsy Siegel. So when you look at all the evidence here that they collected for Nevada and specifically Las Vegas, and they draw their major conclusion, which I've put in bold, that's Mo Sedway. The case in Nevada is too many of the men running the gambling operations are either members of existing out-of-state gambling syndicates or they've had histories of close association with the underworld characters who operate those syndicates. That's Mo Sedway. That's why they were so concerned that they questioned him closely. He gives them the best evidence for this conclusion. Well, they leave town, and Mo is left to spend the rest of his short life working at the Flamingo Hotel. Uh, he will make $30,000 a year in 1950 money. He will have a room at the hotel. He will be someone who recruits talent to be in the showroom. He knows most of the celebrities in uh, Hollywood. He is credited with being a good personnel manager. Some people after he died said, you know, when we had a conflict in the staff, we always knew we could go to Moe and he would help us out. But most importantly, Robbins Cahill, who was the uh, secretary of the Nevada Tax Commission, said if you ever went to the Flamingo, the first guy you would see would be Mo Sedway. He'd jump out of his chair and come up and shake hands and welcome you into the, the casino. So he, he had a good life. When he, he dies in uh, January of, of 1952, he has a massive funeral in L.A. And you can see among the pallbearers, Davey Berman and Moose Panza, and then this fellow I would never want to meet, Willie Alderman, whose nickname was Ice Pick, and the reason they called him Ice Pick was that he had perfected this way of killing people by inserting the ice pick in their ear. And he claimed he had later, that he later said he'd killed about a dozen people that way because it was very effective. But look at the, the people who showed up, all these entertainers. They all knew Sedway. He had recruited many of these people to perform at the Flamingo. So that's the way he went out. And uh, one, the, the last slide I want to use here is from Hank Greenspun's column, Where I Stand. And this is a really important column that he writes, because look at what he does here. He carefully describes Sedway as someone who didn't really have a good background. He writes, he was not a model youth, and he had some defects and possibly a few more weaknesses than the average man, but I say Mo wasn't a bad little fellow at all. And he ends with, no reporter can adequately write a story of the little man unless they heard the familiar words from the corner of his mouth, how much do you need? He was a philanthropist throughout his time in Las Vegas. Anybody who needed help, he would offer. All they had to do, in fact, sometimes they didn't have to ask. He would just give them money because he knew they needed it. He was uh, terrific in running the United Jewish Appeal in 1946. Las Vegas had a quota they were supposed to hit. They were quite a bit under it, so he just wrote a check for $10,000 and got them over the top. What this column illustrates and maybe Mo Sedway's greatest importance is that he is a model. 
Gangsters realize if you go to Nevada, specifically Las Vegas, you can do things that are legal there that are illegal everywhere else, and you can be a respected citizen and leader. Mo Sedway doesn't do it the best. There's another Mo who does it the best, and that's Mo Dalet. But the model is from Mo Sedway. Well, I do deal with a lot of other things in, in the book. Uh, I love putting together this uh, chapter I have on the gambling fraternity, how diverse it was. I really enjoyed writing about his role in the growing Jewish community in, in Las Vegas. And then again, all the things that caused the columnist to call him in the end, the little giant of Fremont Street. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you want to throw my way. One moment. But if you ask it, I won't yeah, be able hello. to see you. Good evening. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Um, my question really has to do with the race wire. Sure. I'm over, I'm over here in the middle. I know you can't see me, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, the question has to do with... Uh, wasn't there any government entity that was controlling the race wire? It just seems to me that it could have been used for some uh, devious purpose. I don't understand the exact reason why they had to have the race wire. What was the purpose of that? <clears throat> the purpose of the race wire was uh, to provide really key information to bookies. They, they would know the track conditions of all the tracks across the country, uh, in addition to getting the results for the races. So it was indispensable information for, for the bookies to have. Uh, there were a lot of lawsuits challenging the monopoly that, that Mo Sedway got. Uh, Dave Stearns really challenged him and said that's, that's a violation of the law as I understand it, but Dave Stearns always lost. So Stearns did something really intriguing. He persuaded a guy to go get a room in the Apache Hotel above the El Dorado Club and cut a hole in the floor and put in some microphones. So as the, the race results are being announced, they'll be picked up by the microphones and it'll be transmitted across the street to his club. So he would get the results without having to pay for it. Well, there was a, a taxi cab driver who would always go down Fremont Street and he told the police, I keep getting these crazy signals and, and I don't know where they're coming from. So the police uh, called some federal agents from the FCC, and they came out from L.A., and they triangulated what was going on, and they, they nailed Dave Stearns because he was stealing this information from, from the uh, El Dorado Club. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but it's, it's, it's entirely legal, and if you're able to get a monopoly control over it, then you're going to make lots of money. The solution for the state of Nevada was they... They refused to grant Sedway any further state licenses. And Dave Stern's the same thing. So they thought they could get rid of the conflict that way. That was a good question. I believe that you insinuated that Mo Sedway knew who... Well, at least he knew that Ben Siegel was going to be murdered or that he was murdered. Okay, so not that he was the murderer, of course, but it implies that he might have been involved with an organization that carried out the murder. And would you have any clues to that organization? Or if not the organization per se, the city in which it arised, say Chicago, Philadelphia, New York? I love your question, and I think I could find the answer if the archives in the Beverly Hills Police Department would let me look at the investigation file. <clears throat> I've tried every time there's been a new chief of police in Beverly Hills, I will write, and I will ask if it's possible to look at the investigation file for the Siegel murder. And the last police chief I tried with actually turned it over to her chief of staff. And she got in touch with me and said, all right, let me take your request to the detective bureau and see what they say. I won't promise anything, but I'll, I'll make your request. And maybe two weeks later, she got back in touch saying they said no. Uh, the reason for it is fundamentally that they call it uh, an open case. 
And my response to them always has been the same. Well, if my math's any good, <laughs> this is over 70 years ago. What are the chances the shooter's still alive? <laughs> but I've gotten nowhere. Uh, 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 two years ago when I, I was in a panel here, I, I asked the audience, if anybody's from the Beverly Hills Police Department or you know somebody, let me know. <laughs> and a gentleman, as he walked out, said, you got to contact Clark Fogg. I said, okay. So I, con I looked him up, and he was retired. Uh, he, was the chief, he was the chief forensic uh, scientist for the Beverly Hills Police Department. And he chatted with me for a while, and, and uh, I said, so are you aware of an investigation file? He said, about a dozen years previous, the chief of police then said, Clark, we're about to hit our centennial. Why don't you write a history of the Beverly Hills Police Department? He did with a co-author. He said, I started going through all the old files, and I found this box with a lot of loose paper in it, and it was the Siegel investigation file. And he said, there is one. I know it exists. I've seen it. I helped put it together. So I said, what's in it? <laughs> That's the answer I got. <laughs> Uh, I don't know whether he signed a non-disclosure agreement or not, but, but he would not tell me what, what he knew about the investigation file. So the best way to answer your question, I'm stumbling around here, if I could see that investigation file, I'd give you a good answer, I think. What do you suppose was the motivation for Sedway to be an informant in 1947? Wonderful question. It's very dangerous to become an informant against the mob. Uh, two examples. There was a fellow named Abe Rellis who was part of Murder Incorporated. These were the savage murderers you'd contact. If you wanted somebody taken out, these guys would do it. And he decided to turn state's evidence. He just he ratted out everybody. All the murders he participated in, and he was naming people, and they promised him protection. So he was put on a in a hotel room, he was the only person on the floor. And there were police in the hallways, police everywhere. And they found him about five stories down. And uh, they, they claimed that he had tied some sheets together and he was trying to get out and that, you know, the sheets broke apart and he fell to his death, which nobody believed. Uh, and then there was a guy named Harry Greenberg, who in 1938-39... Uh, was short on money, and he contacted uh, Lepke Buchhalter, who was also associated with uh, Murder Incorporated, and said, I need some money. If you don't give me some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rat you out. That was a mistake. Uh, he, he went to Detroit for a while. He ended up in, 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 in Los Angeles, and he was murdered. And that was why Siegel was arrested, because the evidence indicated Siegel was involved in at least the planning of Harry Greenberg's murder. He was arrested twice for it, and in both cases, uh, not found guilty. So it was very dangerous to become an informant. Knowing the timing of it, I would think it probably had something to do with his split with Siegel. Because the timing's pretty close. Uh, 1946 is when they split, and the first evidence he's an informant is early 47. That's my best guess. Good question. And maybe that's why he was willing to talk to the Kefauver Committee at length. I have no evidence that the FBI had helped the Kefauver Committee. I don't know. Good question. Any Hi, others? Larry. Hi. I'm over here to your right. Okay, go Hi. far away. I have a thousand questions for you, but uh, I'll, I'll try to limit it to one. So if, uh, if Moe is an FBI informant at that time, and we know that Alan Smiley calls him immediately after Ben is murdered. Number, I guess my first question is, why did Alan uh, call Moe? Do you think Alan knew about the murder in advance? I personally don't. And my second question is, do you think Meyer Lansky knew? Because to me, if uh, Meyer didn't know, and it wasn't sanctioned by the guys back east, um, and in Lucky's case in Italy at the time, I think, then... Uh, Moe's days were numbered after that murder, not because he had heart problems, but because the guys would have found out that he was informing the FBI. 
That's pretty good. It's distilling those thousand questions. Out of but it's a very good question. Uh, specifically, what, what did Lansky know and what did Lansky authorize? Uh, people who asked Lansky, uh, he would always, to the end of his life, say, I had nothing to do with it. I, 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 would, I would have hoped that, that Benny would have lived to be as old as Methuselah. And I remember distinctly, uh, there was a reception from Millicent Rosen, Ben's eldest daughter here at the, at the museum a few years back. And it was a, there was a question and answer session for her. And there were some photos from her life. And one of the photos was her wedding. And the person who was giving her away was Meyer Lansky. So someone in the crowd asked, do you think Meyer Lansky authorized the murder of your father? Well, you remember when I said about Ben Siegel's eyes being mesmerizing? So were hers. She had these steely blue eyes. And she stared at this person who asked that question. And she pointed. She said, didn't you see this photo? Do you think if I believed that Meyer Lansky had authorized the murder of my father, I would have let him give me away at my wedding? Now, that doesn't mean that that's clear evidence he didn't authorize it. It's just that he never acknowledged that he had a role in it. He often said, in fact, in 47, there's some FBI uh, memos in which he kind of speculated, well, maybe it was uh, uh, Virginia Hill's brother. He said, those hot-blooded Southerners, they, they get upset over everything, and, and Ben wasn't treating his sister well. Maybe he's the one that did it. So I, I think Meyer was just really, really good at, at spinning stories, and he never wanted the, the, his connection, whatever it might have been, to be known. Uh, that's me doing a good job of evading giving you a good answer to your question. It's because I really don't know what Lansky's role was. Uh, a, a lot of, some of my history professors when I was in graduate school said, Larry, the problem with you is you're, will, you're unwilling to go beyond the evidence. And I said, well, wait a minute. Historians have to base what they say on the available evidence. I wish I had better evidence. I, I would give you as concrete an answer as I could, but I, I refuse to go beyond the evidence. I just don't know the answer. I have a suspicion that Lansky knew about it and, and believed he probably couldn't do anything because most of his colleagues in the New York mob were so angry with Siegel. Costello, in particular, uh, was angry with him because when Siegel needed more money to finish the Flamingo in the fall of 46, he flew to New York, and the FBI followed him, and they, they wrote a report. They saw him meeting with Frank Costello at the Copacabana, and two sources in Las Vegas, people who lived here, said, you know, when Ben came back, he came back with a suitcase, and he had money in that suitcase. So the assumption was he'd gotten the money from, from Frank Costello. And Costello's lawyer wrote a biography of, of him and said he was so furious that he persuaded his friends to invest in the Flamingo and it, it was losing money. So clearly they were upset with Siegel, but does that mean they authorized the shooting? I don't know. But good questions. Thank you. Larry, uh, a question from our online audience. What okay. do you think about the rumor that Hill's brother was the shooter? Yeah, there, there are several people who contend that. One who was actually here a few years back, Bernie Sindler. Uh, Bernie Sindler, who... Uh, the only time I met Bernie Sindler was after I was on a panel up here in 2015 with uh, Warren Hall. We were talking about the murder of, of Ben Siegel, and I'd given the background on Siegel, the opening of the Flamingo. And when I was walking out, uh, this fellow came up beside me, an elderly gentleman with a cane... And he came up to me and kind of leaned in and said, you did good. <laughs> and I had no idea who that was, but I found out later that was Bernie Sindler, who was at the Flamingo uh, at the time that it opened. He contended that he heard uh, one of Virginia Hill's brothers talking about how viciously uh, Ben had treated his sister, and he was so angry uh, he was going to kill him. Uh, Perhaps. I mean, that story was out there, and I earlier said that, that Meyer Lansky even tossed that out as a possibility. I have no proof for it, but that, that certainly was one suggestion. Good question. We'll just take one more question. 
Okay. No more? Okay. Um. So what makes you think that Meyer Lansky would give a uh, go-ahead on a murder? What makes me think he would give the go-ahead? Yeah, or he had the authority to do I that. I am, I don't know if he did. Um, they were lifelong friends, and I would find it difficult to believe that he would have authorized it. He may have been in a situation where he couldn't have prevented it. Uh, but I... I just don't have evidence one way or the other. I wish I did. I wish I could have a, a clear answer to those questions. Mm, okay. Because it's a good question. Thank you, Larry. And as a reminder, we will be doing a book signing right in the courtroom waiting area. Another round of applause for Larry Graff. Thank you. <laughs> could, could I say one last thing? Uh, Jeff mentioned I'm working on the third volume of a trilogy of biographies. If anybody out there knew Wilbur Clark, or you know anybody who knew Wilbur Clark, let me know. I would love to talk to them. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.